Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Lecture 2A, where we're going to look at the historical background of the ancient Jews from the Babylonian exile through the Roman conquest of the Near East. We're really focusing on the Maccabean Revolt, and I'm titling this lecture From the Maccabees to the Mishnah because we'll go from Jewish history from the time of the Maccabees forward into the second century AD, that is, when the earliest rabbinic composition is put together, namely the Mishnah. This lecture will be in two parts because there's a fair amount of ground to cover. So this is 2A1, and next will be 2A2. The historical overview of this period, we can put up in outline form briskly and then come back and unpack it. So we will begin with what's called the Second Temple Period. That is because the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586. You can think of Old Testament characters like Nebuchadnezzar. The Jews are, have an exile in Babylon, which becomes Persia, and some Jews return to Judea. The Persians are overtaken by the Greeks, and this is what's called the Hellenistic period. Under the, during the Hellenistic period, we have the Maccabean Revolt, and then the Hasmonean Dynasty. The Hasmoneans and the Maccabeans are the same family, but the revolt's called Maccabean and the dynasty is called Hasmonean. And we will conclude this first lecture with the Romans appearing on the scene and conquering the Near East under Pompey the Great. So let's start to flesh this out a little bit. From the Babylonian exile uh, to the Romans, this is a lot of ground to cover, and there's a reason we're going to look at it in some detail. And that is in some ways to counteract the type of impression you could get from your Bible or from certain study Bible charts like this one. In this chart, You'll see that he's describing the period of Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah. These are the Jews who return from Persia to Judea. And he says that from the time this last book is written, Malachi, Revelation is closed until John the Baptist. This is a closing of Revelation. Sometimes people will speak of 500 years of silence from the 5th century to the 1st century. And you could get this impression from your own Bible. You go from the Hebrew Bible to the New Testament with the turn of a page, and that is from Malachi to the Gospel of Matthew, and in fact, they're even talking about similar things. So Malachi concludes with this promise that God will send Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Mark, all begin, more or less, with John the Baptist, who shows up dressed just like Elijah was dressed, that is, John is trying to mimic Elijah and say, hey, I am that guy. I am the one preparing the way of the Lord. But between these two testaments is a 500 year period. That is, Ezra and Nehemiah return in the fifth century. Malachi is written at this time. In the New Testament, we have Jesus and the first writings in the first century. Is this really 500 years of silence? You are welcome to take the view of the canon of scripture such that would say, um, I don't believe God said anything new to the world during this period. But it's important for us to understand that for all the Jews in the first century, they certainly didn't think of this as a time when nothing had been said. It's during this time, from the end of the, the last books of the Hebrew Bible being written to the time of the New Testament, when belief in an afterlife becomes a norm for Jews. The Hebrew Bible says very little about life after death. By the time of the New Testament, almost every type of Jew believes in a life after death. It's in this period that we get the rise of what we will call apocalypticism. I'll say more about that. We get not only apocalyptic thought, a way of understanding history, but we get apocalyptic literature. That is, things a little like the Apocalypse of John, the book of Revelation. Books where a seer tells you what will happen in the distant future. There are a variety of prophets and seers and holy men. It's not like the Jews had the impression that, ah, there's no one who speaks for God. There's no one who does miracles. This whole period is going to be full of miracles and holy men doing all sorts of wonders. Relatedly, there are major national crises, and this is what will primarily concern us today in this first lecture. That is the crisis of Judaism being made illegal in the second century BC which is solved partially by a family leading a war, a rebellion, but also by divine intervention. 
And during this 500 year period, there's constant reflection on scripture that is on the text of the Hebrew Bible. So their Jews are reading and thinking about and retelling, giving expansive retellings of, let's say, Genesis and Exodus and, and Deuteronomy and so on. They're unpacking those texts, they're retelling them. And legends start to creep in. So you say, ah, when Abraham left Ur of the Chaldeans, let's, let's reflect on that and let's think about why he did. I think he learned from the, those crazy astrologers, that is, the Chaldeans were known to be astrologers, he learned that there's one God who, who gives us the regular motions of all the heavenly stars and so on. And finally, lots of new books are written during this period. And there's nothing exactly like an official Jewish list of what books are authoritative. But there are books during this period that were definitely treated as authoritative by many Jews. One we'll talk about is First Enoch. This is a book quoted as scripture in the New Testament by the Epistle of Jude. One book we're reading is Tobit, which may not present itself as scripture per se, but is a book that people would have told and retold, and families, if you're a child reared on this sort of story, then the piety embodied in that book is something you're going to take to heart. Uh, that's how God works. That's how angels work, etc. The book of Sirach is a sort of wisdom book, quite like the book of Proverbs. Sirach was in massively influential for, for Jews, but even more so for Christians. We get retellings of Genesis and Exodus in a book like Jubilees, which basically takes Genesis and Exodus and says, you know what, let's fix these. It presents them as, it presents itself as retelling this story, but trying to uh, specify certain things that it seems troubled that were left unclear. So it says, well, if we're going to keep the Sabbath properly, we need to know what day God created on and what day it is now. So it goes through and retells the book of Genesis and Exodus with great attention to calendrical matters. We could go on. The Wisdom of Solomon, a book written in Solomon's name, trying to make sense of sort of Greek wisdom and Jewish understandings of God. The Letter of Aristeus and so on. I'll say more about these. There are many more books written during this period. The important thing to say is that if we're trying to understand the New Testament and Jews of that time, we've got to know there are some major events that happened after the book of Malachi is written, before the events of the New Testament, and whether or not particular Jews or Christians took these books as authoritative, they would have known them. They write with allusions to them, and the types of theology that develop in this period are taken for granted by the authors of the New Testament. They don't question anymore whether there's an afterlife, whether there are angels. Those things are established during this time. Here begins, then, our historical overview. So to recap, the first temple, that is Solomon's temple, is destroyed. The Jews go into Babylonian exile. The Persians then take over the kingdom of the Babylonians. And during the Persian period, Cyrus the Great allows some Jews to return to Judea. Cyrus's role in this is, in fact, described in the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament, as Cyrus's role as God's Messiah. If you wonder what the Old Testament says about the Christ, the Messiah, it names the Messiah. It says it's Cyrus. Thus says the Lord to, to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue the nations before him. That is, Isaiah here depicts Cyrus as a tool of the Lord to send God's people back to their promised land, to Judea. Important changes happen in this time. Namely, Cyrus says you can put your high priests in charge of this territory, and a Zadokite high priesthood is in charge. That is, of the priestly line, the line of Levi, there are Zadokites as one family within that line, and they're in charge. The second important thing that happens in this period is that the temple is rebuilt. But according to Ezra, the temple is somewhat uninspiring. So back in Leviticus, they picture a divine fire descending upon the altar to show that God had accepted a sacrifice. Second Chronicles says that the same thing happened in the first temple as God's way of saying, I'm here, we are now operational, 
And according to Ezra, when the second temple was built, people kind of cried, kind of teared up and said, this ain't quite like the first one. There's always some anxiety about the second temple that maybe it's not as good and maybe it's not working. You can see in second Maccabees, an effort to claim, no, 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 there, there was a fire on the second temple. It counted. But the very fact that it protests in that direction reminds us that not everyone was persuaded. Important thing here is that priests run Judea. This is really a big deal. For 500 years, for the most part, Judea is under priests, not kings. So while we may be used to thinking of the Old Testament story, where God picks David and David's line to be kings over Israel, to an outsider thinking about the Jews, they might say, and I quote here from a Greek historian, the Jews never had a king. They give authority to whichever priest is superior to his colleagues in wisdom and virtue. That's Hecateus of Abdera. Hecateus is entirely wrong. Of course, the Jews did have a king, David and so on. But you can see here that for a long time, the Jews are under a priest, and that becomes normal. An outsider might think they were a people without a king. Moving along, we go quickly from the Persians to Alexander the Great. Here's a mosaic. We see Alexander in battle. Alexander quickly conquers almost the exact territory that was the Persian domain. And when Alexander dies, his empire is divided among four of his generals. The two kingdoms that will concern us are the Seleucids, which is primarily Asia Minor, and in this time period also bits of Iraq and Iran, and the Ptolemies, who are in Egypt. You can see that Palestine here is right in between the boundary of the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, that is the successors to Alexander's empire, these huge Greek kingdoms. And that means that as the Seleucids and the Ptolemies battle back and forth and expand, this line between them expands and contracts, Palestine is often uh, something of a bargaining tool. We will pick up the story with the time that the Seleucids take over Palestine, the beginning of the 2nd century BC. When the, when the Seleucids come into Palestine, they're actually welcomed by the Jews. The Jews say, hey, uh, we wouldn't mind a, a change of leadership. And in fact, the Seleucid leader, Antiochus III, treats Jews pretty well. And he says, you know what, you can have your own ritually clean meat, I'm going to reduce your taxes, I want you to be happy. But things will turn for the worse shortly. Antiochus III has a disastrous battle with Rome and has to pay a huge war indemnity. He's, in, he's broke and he in fact dies plundering a temple trying to get money. His son, his successor, Seleucus IV, is the one who, in 2 Maccabees, is broke and sends uh, an agent, Heliodorus, to try to take money from the temple in Jerusalem. So the Seleucid kingdom is in need of money. They're trying to steal it from whatever temple they can find. And next, and here's where our story gets interesting, and here's where your reading picks up. We come to Antiochus IV, surnamed Epiphanes. That means God made manifest. Antiochus IV Epiphanes. And Antiochus IV starts to meddle in who is the priest in Jerusalem. And he appoints Jason, Onias III's brother. And according to the texts we're looking at, Jason was a bad guy. Jason is friends with this Greek overlord, and Jason shifted his compatriots, that is the Jews, to a Greek way of life. And things are so dire in Israel that even the priests prefer Greek games. They want to go wrestling rather than doing the work, the sacred work of God at the altar. Jason, in fact, as priest in Judea, high priest, says, oh, I want to show how cosmopolitan I am. So he sends sacrifices for the Greek god Heracles at holy games being held up the coast in Tyre. First Maccabees tells a similar story. First Maccabees says, in those days, those dark days, so we're at the beginning of the second century BC, certain renegades came out from Israel and misled many and said, let's make a covenant with the Gentiles around us. You can see that 
Although 1 Maccabees strongly disapproves of this idea, many in Israel gladly adopted the Greek king's religion. It's not just Jason the high priest. There's others who say, you know what? You want to know why we've had such a hard time getting along? Is because we try to live as a peculiar people. Let's build a gymnasium in Jerusalem. Let's make Jerusalem a solid, respectable Greek city like all the others. Let's get rid of the things that make us distinctive. According to 1 Maccabees 1, the Jews actually tried to undo the mark of circumcision. That is, they underwent the, the operation of what's now called epispasm, to undo circumcision. Because when you're in the Greek uh, palaestra, the, the gymnasium wrestling, you wrestle naked. And the Jews realize, hey, we're circumcised. We don't look like the other boys. Let's make ourselves like everyone else. Things go from culturally uh, tumultuous to positively disastrous at the point that Antiochus IV Epiphanes outlaws Jewish practice. The traditional date given to this is the 25th of the Jewish month Kislev in the year 167. According to 1st Maccabees, Antiochus set up a desolating sacrilege. Remember that expression, because Daniel will use it and Jesus will use it in the New Testament. Antiochus set up some sort of profane, desolating sacrilege on the altar. There were pagan sacrifices, there were all sorts of abominations, and there were severe persecutions of law-abiding Jews. So anyone who refused his decree and said, you know what, I still want to circumcise my child, I want to rest on the Sabbath, I want to eat only kosher food, these Jews were persecuted, and they paid with their lives. In response to these monstrosities, this dire situation, Mattathias, this country priest, arises. He kills a Jew who's trying to uh, comply with pagan sacrifices, and he issues the clarion cry, let everyone who is zealous for the law and supports the covenant come out with me. This language of zeal for the law, which we'll find Paul uses of himself in the New Testament, gets its start here with echoes of Phineas in the book of Numbers, who similarly killed someone who was compromising Israelite purity. Mattathias in initiates this rebel uprising. He's succeeded by his son, Judas Maccabeus. Perhaps that name means the hammer or hammerhead. And Judas has the success of regaining Jerusalem and restoring the purity of the cult and the temple. This happens three years after it had been defiled by the pagan sacrifices, and this is what's commemorated as the festival of Hanukkah, a festival mentioned in the New Testament in the book of John. In fact, 2 Maccabees opens the first two chapters, which aren't required reading for us this week, opens with letters from Jerusalem to Egyptian Jews reminding them they need to observe Hanukkah. So this is the beginning of a new holiday commemorating this event. Judas eventually dies in battle because although they've restored Jerusalem, they don't have the rest of the countryside. This is only a city, and this whole territory is controlled by, by the Seleucids. And somewhat alarmingly, we find these little notes in 1 Maccabees that after Judas dies, the renegades emerged in all parts of Israel. Let's come back to that because basically 1 Maccabees wants to paint a picture that Everyone with a head on his shoulders loved the Maccabean family and wanted to be part of this revolution. But it can't help but admit, yeah, there were also people who kind of just wanted to get along with the king and move on and be Jews who got along with the rest of the world. In any event, we'll come back to that in a concluding reflection. After Judas comes Jonathan. After Jonathan comes Simon. Simon is to be high priest forever until a trustworthy prophet should arise. And after Simon comes his son, John Hyrcanus. Now here we get a real change, is that at this point, under John Hyrcanus, it's not simply a matter of purifying Judea. It's a matter now of territorial expansion beyond where Judeans live. So under John Hyrcanus, with foreign mercenaries, he is now hiring foreigners to fight. They expand south into Idumea and force circumcision upon them and say, you're part of Judea now. 
They go east into Transjordan. They go north into Samaria and burn the Samaritans' temple. The Samaritans had a temple on Mount Gerizim. The Jews burned it to the ground under the Hasmoneans, under John Hyrcanus. When we get to the New Testament and we're casually told Jews and Samaritans don't get along, this is the sort of thing that lay in the not-too-distant past that led to hard feelings. All this area in orange is territory that Hyrcanus gained for the kingdom of the Hasmoneans. This, as you can imagine, troubles some Jews. Let's imagine some Jews join with the Maccabeans and say, yes, we should be free to follow the law of Moses. Yes, it certainly won't do to have a pagan sacrifice offered in our holy temple. So they join with the fighting for a little bit, but once the temple's restored and a bit of Judea is set free, they say, you know what, that's good. Now let's go back to how we've been living for 350 years under priests who rule the territory. At this point that these, these Hasmoneans are continuing to expand to use foreign soldiers, there's going to be some who say, I don't think that's what I signed up for. We get a comment from Josephus, the Jewish historian, that Eliezer the Pharisee, note that this is the period when groups like Pharisees emerge, and it's over issues like the ones we're describing. Eliezer the Pharisee says, John, if you want to be righteous, you can't be high priest. You can just be king. You, you can be a secular ruler, but you can't also be high priest. In the Old Testament, the priests are of the Levitical family, the kings are of the, the tribe of Judah, and the same person can't, under normal circumstances, be priest and king, according to Mosaic law. So we get some, some notes of discord. Let's just move along through some of the other Hasmoneans, and we'll see this territorial expansion in, increases dramatically. So there's going to be both apprehension about them, but also a certain measure of pride. Look at the the territory ultimately conquered by Alexander Janaeus is greater than the territory that was part of the kingdom of David. So now we're talking about a domain larger than Israel had had sovereignty over in 800 years. How do the Pharisees feel about that? The Pharisees feel so bad about that that they go to the neighboring king, Demetrius, and say, would you please invade our country? We want to be ruled by priests, not by these crazy Hasmoneans. And at that point, Alexander Janaeus crucifies 800 Pharisees for that treachery and retaliation. So you get to see here, there are now religious groups saying, our aims for a holy nation conflict with your aims of increasing territory and being a, a mighty country following the rules of realpolitik. Alexander Janaeus was married to a queen of Israel. You may not have known that Israel had a queen, Salome Alexandra, who ruled for almost a decade. According to Josephus, Alexander Janaeus, after all of his troubles with the Pharisees, said, you know what, sweetheart, I think you should listen to the Pharisees. And according to Josephus, she had the name of royalty, but the Pharisees were the real power in court. They were the ones who said what to do. We reach a point in the story now where Rome has entered the international scene. Rome's been growing as a power for centuries. At this point, Pompey comes to the Near East and he destroys the minor dynasts down the coast. When he reaches Damascus, it's clear to everyone that he will choose which, which descendant of this family will be, the, will be the kinglet, the one in charge. Of course, Rome will be pulling the strings. It's interesting to see who goes out to meet Pompey and to say, pick me. Hyrcanus shows up, Aristobulus shows up, but so does a party just simply known as the priests. What this reveals is that for as much as the people may have appreciated the Hasmonean family liberating them from the Seleucids, there's a lingering sense that the right way for Judea to be run is under Zadokite priests. We want to reflect at this point on some of the theological importance of this period. And among the things we could note, is that this is the period where we see a certain shift in, in interpreting history from what we might call a deuteronomistic approach 
to what we might call an apocalyptic approach. We'll define these terms. We can start with deuteronomistic. This, in a nutshell, is the way of understanding the fate of Israel as laid out in the final chapters of Deuteronomy. Here Moses says, in short, folks, you've got the law. If you obey it, God will bless you. If you disobey it, God will curse you. And once he's given that programmatic interpretation of Israel's fate, we can see throughout the rest of the books of the Old Testament, prophets precisely interpreting Israel's history, history in these terms. So when they are being defeated by other nations, the prophets step up and say, think about the covenant. This must mean we're not keeping the law. And one thing prophets do is explain which laws are being neglected and what it is in particular that God's unhappy about. This sort of interpretation can be seen to still be quite alive and well in the Maccabean period, as it will be in the New Testament period. So this doesn't go away. We see, in fact, uh, Mattathias step forward and say, let those who are zealous for the law come to me. What's important in, in the Hasmonean's view is to adhere to the law, to restore a pure priesthood, to restore a pure cult in accordance with what God had ordained so that God could bless the people of Israel. But you can see that this interpretive framework comes to something of a crisis in this period. Think about what's happening under, under the Seleucids. It's not simply people who are being disobedient to the law who are being punished. You actually have a state of affairs where it's obedience to the law that leads to suffering. Who's having their child hung around their neck? It's people who refused to forego circumcision, who kept the law. Think about the Maccabean martyrs, who, with their blood, testified to their faithfulness to the law. At that point, you can't simply say, ah, if you break the law, you'll suffer as a people. It's, it's quite the opposite. And here you see, at this very time period, and because of this crisis, the apocalyptic way of interpreting history, as we get, for instance, in the book of Daniel, which is written during this time, where to not do the theology of Daniel full justice, we might say not simply obey and be blessed, but God has a plan. That is, God may bring suffering, and God may even bring suffering upon the faithful, perhaps especially upon the faithful, but this is for a finite number of days. There may be a finite number of kingdoms which will arise in doing pernicious things. But God has planned when God will redeem God's people. Tuck this away because we'll look more at apocalyptic thinking later on. But part of a kernel of apocalyptic thinking is recognizing that you can't always explain whether Israel is doing well or badly based on whether they're following the law or not. It's because of the crisis of this period that this new thinking emerges. I want to conclude with some more challenging questions. These are sort of second order questions, but you may find them interesting. And they go like this. A real historical problem with the Maccabean Revolt is that it seems out of character for Antiochus Epiphanes to have forbidden the practice of Judaism. He didn't treat other local cults, that is, other local religious practices in his kingdom this way. Now, later, ancient historians would give their own interpretation of what Antiochus did, and it's interesting to quote too because they give us a little flavor of how some people viewed the Jews in the ancient world. So let's quote from the Roman historian Tacitus. Here's Tacitus's summary. Tacitus is writing at the end of the first century AD, so sometime later. King Antiochus strove to destroy the national superstition. That is, Tacitus is no friend of Judaism. And he tried to introduce Greek civilization, but he was prevented from improving this vilest of nations. The Jews chose kings for themselves. Here, Tacitus is speaking about the Hasmoneans. And these princes ventured on the wholesale destruction, or the wholesale banishment of their subjects, on the destruction of cities, on the murder of brothers, wives, and parents, and the usual atrocities of despots fostering the national superstition by appropriating the dignity of the priesthood 
to support their political power. Now, between all of Tacitus's prejudice and some of the historical inaccuracies, he has a view of the Maccabees that's not so different from some contemporaries. It's not so different from what we saw some of the Pharisees saying. Namely, they were kings, and in order to strengthen their position, as they did the usual thing despots do, they appropriated the national religion. That is, they said, you know what, let's be priests as well. Tacitus finds this merely the move of petty despots, but for the Pharisees, this was this was irreligious. This was sacrilege. We'll just give one other Greek, hist a Greek historian now, one other ancient historian, Diodorus Siculus. Diodorus has a quite a lurid tale, and I don't give this to give it any credence whatsoever. It just gives you an idea of some of the streams of anti-Jewish thought that circulated in the ancient world. He says, he says that Antiochus Epiphanes discovered in the temple a statue of a bearded man with a book riding a donkey. And it turns out that this man was Moses, the founder of Jerusalem and the organizer of their nation, who ordained for the Jews their misanthropic and lawless customs. It's a sort of ironic. The lawgiver gave lawless customs. That's how Diodorus Siculus sees it. Of course, the Jews had no statue whatsoever in their temple, but this legend arises that they revered a lawgiver, they hated other peoples because they separated from them, they wouldn't intermarry, they had peculiar food customs. Diodorus continues, shocked by such hatred against all mankind, Antiochus, as a good and noble and broad-minded Greek king, set himself to break down their traditional practices. So he was just Poor guy was just trying to better this, this backward, misanthropic people. So he did what he could. Those are the answer of a Greek historian and a Roman historian, neither of whom liked the Jews at all. There's one other way to think about Antiochus's persecution of the Jews, and that is of Elias Bickerman, a very great scholar of Second Temple Judaism, who said, the origin of this persecution was with enlightened Jews in Jerusalem. It was their idea. What Bickerman noticed was a few important facts. One was that all the other local religious customs throughout the realm of the Seleucids were Hellenized. That is, they got a Greek name to them or some Greek decor, but they weren't outlawed. The Arabs within the Seleucid realm were still allowed to practice circumcision. Uh, all the local peoples continued to, to do what they did. So it doesn't seem to be the case that Antiochus Epiphanes actually said everyone has to worship exactly the same way. And in fact, it isn't even all the Jews who were affected. It was only the Jews in Judea. What Bickerman concluded then is if there's local persecution, there's a local source. And he seized on another interesting fact, which is that at least two sources suggest the high priest Menelaus in Jerusalem is the one who said to Antiochus, would you please reform us? Notice that in 2 Maccabees 13 and in Josephus, we're told that Menelaus was put to death because he had persuaded Antiochus to change the laws. That is, Antiochus, after the war broke out, said, why on earth did you suggest this? And notice a verse in Daniel. Daniel is speaking about Antiochus, and he says, Antiochus will pay heed to those who forsake the covenant. That is, Antiochus got his idea, he listened to, renegade Jews who forsook the covenant. If Bickerman's right, what would Menelaus' motivation have been? Well, it would be something like enlightened Yahwism. That is, a monotheism, a philosophically inclined monotheism, free of what people like Menelaus would have called unhelpful accretions and additions, things like the food taboos the kosher food laws, or the practice of circumcision, or the purity laws in general. That is, Menelaus may have said, you know what? We could fit into the Hellenistic world really well. We have a lot of things going for us. We're already monotheists, and so are most Greek philosophers. All we need to do is get rid of some of these things, which I'm not even sure go all the way back to our first history. Interestingly, Another Greek historian, Strabo, 
describes Jewish history like this. He says, originally, they were a philosopher race. So I gave a couple quotations which indicated Greeks and Romans who took a fairly dim view of the Jews because of their, their special laws. But there were also a lot of ancients who thought the Jews must be a special race of philosophers because after all, they had a temple with no God inside, no image, no statue. That must mean they think like Socrates does, that God has no image. Um, and there were, there were other reasons they were very impressed with the idea of the Jews, Jews being philosophically inclined. Strabo tells a sort of history and evolution of the Jews. And, and he says, Moses, Moses's successors kept Moses's pure philosophical religion. They were truly pious toward God. But afterwards, superstitious men were appointed to the priesthood. And then tyrannical people. And from superstition arose abstinence from the flesh, that is things like not eating pork, and circumcision and other observances of this kind. We don't have to endorse or reject Bickerman's view. What I think is quite important to say is that whether or not Bickerman's exactly right about the origin of Antiochus's uh, persecution of the Jews, he is definitely correct, and this is important. He is definitely correct to say that in the 3rd century BC, the 2nd century BC, the time of the Maccabean Revolt, and on, onward into our period, there were a diversity of views about what it meant to be faithful to the God of Israel. And there were philosophically inclined Jews who either dispensed with some of the peculiarities of the law altogether, or, as we'll see later, interpreted them allegorically so as to avoid their most literal force. For here, we will return to, in our next lecture, this historical survey, and we'll pick up with the entry of the Romans into the Near East and the rise of the King Herod the Great.